BeastNet is brought to you by James Safety Services in partnership with OCR Bunny and OCR Strong. Here we discuss all things OCR and fitness related. Welcome to BeastNet. I guess we can just start going since we already kind of started <laughs> it, but hopefully Don will at least edit out some of that so it doesn't sound like I'm a complete asshole, but you know. Yeah, we don't need family drama in there. Yeah, don't don't keep the family family drama in there. So I do. By the way, I love the the hoodie. Oh, it's it's a onesie. Oh, it's a onesie. It's a full onesie. So it's there's like a whole thing because um, obviously we were in Texas. Yeah, you gotta get for, the for um for world's toughest mutter and tomorrow is Spartan Fenway and every year at Spartan Fenway I do a funsy lap so me and my friends go out in funsies and it's usually under the lights and like the announcer will always make a point and be like oh my gosh is that pikachu or look at that unicorn and like we'll be out on course and people will be laughing like oh my gosh we love the costumes those are so great and then we'll get on the obstacles and they'll they'll be like oh my gosh you actually know what you're doing it's like yeah so like at one point like a couple of years ago we all climbed the rope at the exact same time and like i think justin manning was on the microphone and was like oh my gosh look out in center field you have all of the magical creatures up at the top of the rope so coming off of world's toughest mutter I'm like, I don't know in what capacity I'll be running Fenway, but obviously I'm going to be there. I have to be there. It's right down the road. Yep. I'm like, my friend told me I had to go to Bucky's while I was in Texas, mm -hmm. that yeah, it's like essential. And he's like, you will not even believe what this place is. So we met him at Bucky's and he's like, Megan, they have onesies. So I'm like, yes. I need to get a onesie and it actually wasn't very expensive. So I'm like, okay, I am going to wear a Bucky's onesie around at Fenway with my world's toughest mutter headband. So if people are like, what are you doing? Like, why aren't you like racing or why aren't you going faster? I'll be like, listen, don't you see? I came straight from world's toughest mutter. Yeah. Oh yeah. And see, that, that's one thing that I didn't, I mean, I knew about it a little bit before, like when we came down to visit a few times, but once we moved down here, it's like Bucky's is, Bucky's is it. <laughs> it's um, a way of life. But what's kind of sucks though, is we really, the only time we've been to Bucky's really since we've been down here is on the way down and then on the way back from World's Toughest because there's not one really close to us. Oh. I mean, there is, it's about 30 miles, but still, I mean, it's, so there's none in our travels, but we were coming back from world's toughest. It's like, there's a Bucky's. We got to stop at Bucky's. So, <laughs> and yep. I, I dragged my poor de destroyed body through Bucky's. But <laughs> it's okay. I did too. I was hobbling the entire time. Yeah. Which, I mean, of course we were going to have talk about world's toughest. Yes. I don't know. You, you seem to like the post I just put up. So that's going to be my, you yes, know, my I'm race. so excited for you. Oh my gosh. Yay. <laughs> Now I've signed up for it. So there's no turning back. No so turning that's... back, but you have a tr a bike trainer now. I do. I do. And actually, I was so mad at myself today. I didn't realize like I've used the stuff in my gym bag. I thought it was loaded and I was going to go to the, the gym and go for a swim at lunch. Yeah. And I opened my bag and my shorts weren't in there. And I'm like, well, that's going to be a bad swim. So I probably Ooh. shouldn't go. Yeah. If I don't have I... shorts, that's not going to end well. And for anybody listening, he just signed up for the half Ironman in Texas. Yes. If you couldn't gather that already, um, yeah. that is officially and, uh, what he has signed uh, up for. I've been talking about it, but so, and finally it's like, you know, I have to sign up for it because if I sign up for it, then I have to train for it. I mean, yes, I don't have to, but it'd be really good. So if It'd I'm be a finish great it, idea I, if you could train for it. I'm going to finish it. I need, I need to really train for that. So yeah, like I said, I have the, you, you said I have the trainer. Mm -hmm. I'm an indoor trainer now, so um, I've already used it a couple times where um, like, we'll sit down and watch TV, and instead of just sitting on the couch, I'll hop on the trainer, and I can watch TV from the trainer. That's amazing. So, and just get moving and get going. Plus, two, it gets me more seat time on that bike. I don't have a lot of seat time on that bike, mm -hmm. so and I need to get the seat time on that bike if that's the one I'm going to use. Good. So, it'll be good. It'll be good. So, Good. yeah, and that gets me my, that's in April. So that gets me my first race next year. 
Uh, awesome. So you got to get to work. Yeah, I got to get to work. Yeah. So, because yeah, the only race I've got planned next year so far is that one. And then of course, see Sue in June, which I'm already signed up for. Mm -hmm. Ragnar in July. So I'll fly back, you know, to Washington for those two races. And then of course, I'm pretty sure I'm going to do WTM again next year. But... Yay. So I'm not sure in what capacity, because that's one okay. thing we'll talk about. Like the way we both did WTM, you know, this last weekend, but we did it differently. You yes. did it as a competitor. I did it as support for, you know, an adaptive athlete. So I didn't get the chance to do as much because I was more about but keeping what her you going. did was still brutal. Like your laps took more energy than other people's laps because you were helping no. the entire time. It was, so. it was interesting, but I mean, and we got more miles than we expected. So. Oh, it was so inspiring to watch. Yeah. My legs hurt though. <laughs> I have a client who is 73 and I came back and we were, you know, lifting and I was telling him about the race or whatever and he's doing something like pull-ups or something and he's like you need to give me a break I'm 73 years old like I can't be doing a lot of this stuff and I was like wait 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 <laughs> and then I wait. pulled out Facebook and I showed him Mar Marla's post and I said 78 years old at 30 miles at world's toughest mudder and I, and I actually, I just did an episode with her and I mean, talking to her about it. And I mean, I think a lot of people don't realize, yes, she did spend part of that in the chair, but she walked yeah, a lot more than people think. Yeah. I saw her walking. Bit. She went up and over Mutterhorn multiple times. Um, I mean, she did, if she didn't do the obstacles, one of us did, you know, but for the most part, she did them. The one she couldn't do was the water. She couldn't go mm -hmm. in the water because of her, you know, her illness and everything. But um, a lot of those, like where you did the 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 trialing with the the barrel in the middle. Yep. She did that. We just had two people in the water, keeping her from falling into the water. So she went over that three of the three of the five laps or the six. That's laps. amazing. So she did a lot more than people think. I think a lot of people think that you know she just kind of sat there in the chair and we pushed her around. It's like no, she did quite a bit. I think anybody who knows Marla knows that she wouldn't oh, be no. able to just sit down and get pushed through a course. No, you it, don't know how many times we helped her over something and then all of a sudden turned around and she's 100 yards down the tra trail just taking off. Like, come like on, guys, she, let's go. She has been doing these courses for years. Maybe not World's Toughest Mudder, but she's out there at, you know, Spartans and whatever else on her own mm -hmm. doing the course. So for her to be able to do world's toughest mother is phenomenal. Yeah. And two weeks before surgery, she's supposed to have like back surgery. Oh my gosh. Like, yeah, she's doing, I think Arizona this weekend and the very, like three days after that, I think she's supposed to have back surgery. She's already doing Arizona this weekend. I think so. Yeah. Cause oh and remember it's cause she had her, her one friend that was supposed to do one more lap together and he died like a month ago. So they're doing oh. it in remembrance of him. So it's yeah. Good for her. And the other great thing about World's Top is I finally got to meet you in person. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that did happen. Yeah, which was awesome. And then I saw you a couple times on the laps and you know, got to see you out there just kicking ass. Oh well, thank you. It from what I heard though, from a lot of people, because this was your first WTM too, yep. right? Yep. And I heard a lot of people say that the the penalty loops were way worse than normal. Oh my gosh. Can, okay. I don't want to be that person that just continues to harp on what's going on with these races, but we really need to talk about those penalty loops. I understand the need to make penalty loops harder than the actual obstacles. I get that. I'm not complaining about that, but these weren't tough mutter penalties. These were Spartan penalties. Hmm. And like we, we can just kind of go through what all of the penalties were. The first one was for well clung, which I will say at five foot two, maybe five foot three on a good day, maybe five foot three with my shoes on. Um, there was no jumping to that for me. 
maybe if they would have had a better platform to jump off of. But the fact that it was like just dug out, you couldn't mm -hmm. tell where the edge was. I would have had to have gotten a serious running start, but then you have to jump up and out and it was just way too high. So every time I had to take the penalty regardless, um, that penalty wasn't that bad. It was holding a log and an egg and you do this small little loop. Um, and the logs, I would say they were not proportional to one another. There were some that were super tiny, some that were bigger. So, um, mm -hmm. Do what you will with that. Um, then the the balance beam, Twinkle Toes, it was walk this way. The only bad thing about that was that they put it on a cactus bed. And if you've done walk this way, you're, if you're, the front of your board is getting snagged, you're falling face first and falling onto a bed of cacti is not fun. No. Um, then let's see, we probably didn't have another penalty until Grappler which I think Grappler was probably the worst designed obstacle slash penalty as a whole. The, mm -hmm. the obstacle itself, I have no problem with. Like, I love that they threw in an obstacle that required a skill that none of us really have. And it was like, learn on the fly. So I have no yeah. problem with Grappler as an obstacle. But you have a 15 to 20 minute bottleneck just so you can go take your three shots and then it's a three quarter mile loop with wading through a swamp water like mm, yeah that was a bit much we shouldn't be spending an hour on a single penalty yeah um maybe i mean i guess maybe not an hour if you're like running that loop but again there's swamp water down there and nobody's running through that swamp water especially when yeah. it gets dark out um so that was very poorly designed. Then you had operation, which I attempted once. I felt um, I, I felt the zap and it went all down my spine and I was dealing with some like tightness in my chest for two, two hours after that. I said, nope, I'm done with that one. And I went and I took the penalty and it was super easy. I mean, it was... a uh, it wasn't the longest loop, wasn't the shortest loop, but you had to put a band around just below your hips, between your hips and knees, and you had to walk the loop. I mean, the bands were stretched out enough that you could just walk normal. So that wasn't yeah. that bad. Um, then let's see. You had the first of the hanging ones. I forget what it was called. All of the hanging ones were mm -hmm. very bizarre yeah. names. It was the one that typically has the doorknobs on it, but the boards were swinging so everything was swinging I beat yeah. that multiple times at one point I cramped up on it and I fell and then as the night went on it was just caked in mud and you couldn't hold on um, and that's what I heard that's what I ended up happening with most of them by the end of them I know yes. almost all of them had so yes. much mud and there was no, no well chance. yeah and we'll kind of get into that because one of the big complaints I have is just basic course design. Um, but I digress. Um, so penalty for that was supposed to be where you have a bucket, you fill it with dirt. They give mm -hmm. you a specific target, like weight that you have to hit. They say, okay, put 20 pounds of dirt in this, walk the loop, and then we're going to weigh it at the end. And you need to be between like three and five pounds of that weight um again in pounds you have people coming from the uk all over the world who you know work with kilos not everybody's going to know that yeah. i heard somebody spent upwards of 40 minutes just trying to get their bucket correct and that's why by the time that i finally had to do it they scrapped that and said just fill your bucket up to the top Oh, wait, that no, and maybe that was Dingleberries. That was the Dingleberries penalty for the other hanging one. It was mm -hmm. um, you had to run this long loop and midway point. They had a stake and you had to drive a stake into the ground. If you broke the stake, you had to give them 10 penalties and then grab a new stake, drive it into the ground. And then you had to pull it out and pulling it out probably took the most amount of time. And then you had to finish the loop and keep going. Um, then from there, penalties 
dingleberries was probably the next one. We just went over that with the weight. Mm -hmm. Then for the tyro, it was um, you have a plate and a water balloon and you have to walk this short loop with a water balloon on a plate. The plate was sectioned off. So like you could legitimately put the water balloon in one of the smaller sections and pretty much run it. So that was kind of stupid. Um, mm -hmm. Not hard wasn't the longest so I didn't complain because I hate those straps and if anybody saw what happened to me after OCRWC I had really bad rope burn on the insides of my knees and like around my leg from the tyro at OCRWC mm -hmm. um, so the straps that they were using for a tyro I it just cut up my hands and that spot on my knees so when I realized the penalty was so easy I'm like you know I'm just gonna keep taking the penalty because there's no point. Yeah. Um, Keep taking then, the penalty rather than like cutting yourself up. Yeah, exactly. Um, then coach's corner was probably the next penalty. And that was 60 burpees, which people were actually taking. Um, that's dumb. I'm sorry. Yeah. But like, if you have people coach's that can't. Corner was. Yeah, it was so easy. But you have the menthol gas in there. So if people have respiratory issues, you should not be making them do 60 burpees. Like, well, what's I, funny too is for me, the menthol actually made my, my lungs feel better. Yeah, mine too. Um, that cargo net was horrible. Absolutely terrible. And the fact that the mud under there was like cement. So then you get this caked on mud as you climb up the rope, your shoes and your hands are all muddy. It's gross. Uh, but that's that is what caused the issue at Funky Monkey. Um, but yeah, the coach's corner penalty, I understand why you have it so high to discourage people from not doing it, because in all reality, it's so easy. But there are people that said, medically, I can't do this. So you're going to go make them do 60 burpees? Hello, burpees are not a Tough mutter thing to begin with. But then no. 60 burpees is horrendous. Like you know, they say, oh hey, I can't do this because I have a a lung issue, and now yeah. you're gonna make me do sixty burpees. Yeah, do sixty burpees. Um, yeah. so that was a massive misstep on um Tough Mudder's part. Then we got to per lap. Yeah, per lap. Then we get to Spunky Monkey, which was a tyro rope up to the monkey bars. Um, I had no problem climbing that rope up. I got to the top of that rope and you hit this massive thing of mud because you're on a tyro. You're just coming out of coach's corner where everything is cement like mud. And even if we dried off our hands, now you have your feet wrapped around this rope in order to transition, to turn yourself around to the monkey bars. You have to keep that rope wrapped around your leg to get to the trapeze, to then swing to the monkey bars. Uh, so our hands are now muddy again, which wasn't our fault. We dried our hands off. Like what were we supposed mm -hmm. to do? Completely clear off our shoes. So the person behind us didn't have an issue. Like that's dumb. So I got onto the trapeze. I got to, onto the monkey bar. I was swinging down, but I could tell my hands were just so muddy. I got three from the end and I straight fell down. Um, that happened to me twice. Um, the penalty for it, when I got there, it was where you stepped into a potato sack. You had to hold it up to your waist with one hand and then have the other hand over your head like you're a cowboy with the lasso. And you had a nice long penalty where you had to make your way through this loop in a potato sack. Um I, of course, got my potato sack from a volunteer who said it. Oh, this one's perfect. Here you go. This is great. And then I realized why he said it was great, because everybody around me had torn holes in their potato sacks and were walking two feet, just straight walking. Um, yeah. I shuffled my feet through that entire thing. It hurt. One point people are like, oh, Megan, there's a, you have a hole now in the back of your bag. You can walk now. And it's like. They It got to the point where they had zero potato sacks by the second time around, and they just nixed it. But again, like, 
you can't do the penalty you're, or you can't do the obstacle because everything is caked in mud. I'm sure by later in the night when nobody was doing it, the people that did finally do it, they were like, oh, there's no more mud up here because it's dried or whatever else. Um, let's see. Then we went to Augustus Gloop. That was fine. Then you went to the last hanging obstacle, which I heard throughout the night, only five people completed it overnight. And again, you're That's soaking me. wet. That's me. Yeah, you're soaking wet from Augustus Gloop, mm -hmm. and it's a rig with rings to a trapeze bar, ring, banana, banana. I got to the banana, and, you know, I, I slipped off. I'm like, this is ridiculous. So it that was a really long loop with you get to a certain point, and you have a bucket with quarters, and you're told, find the nickel. Of course, Everybody finds the nickel, puts it right back on top. So you're really just running this really long loop, stopping for two seconds yeah. and then continuing on. Not hard, but it's a stupid long loop. Then you had Mutterhorn and then you, the last penalty for Everest. You had, again, a long running loop. Why do you have a running loop for a penalty that was then you had to sit with your hands in a bucket of ice water for one minute. So you're already losing one minute on an obstacle that takes a couple seconds because Everest angels are amazing. Um, and then once your hands are frozen wet, you have to build a little Lego set. And that's like the most tough mutter penalty they had the entire time. I had no problem with that, especially when they said there was nothing in the rules saying you can't wear your blank mitts. Um <laughs> But overall, the penalties added on, I heard it was a 5K worth of penalty mileage every lap. Yeah, I heard anywhere from two to three, two to three miles. Yeah, depending I heard. Depending on how many of you had, how many you had to do. Yeah, I heard up to 3.1. Yeah, because I saw a lot of people saying, hey, I got 45 miles according to Tough Mudder, but my watch is saying 60 something. Uh, you know, 55, like, my, the... my watch said. It was 66.9, but my ultra track was also off. So it never gave me a full five miles for all of the loops. Uh, so I would put it over 70 for me. Yeah. Which, I mean, that's, that's a huge difference. It's huge. And I mean, I get there's supposed to be penalties to, you know, to, to encourage you to do, to, to finish the obstacles. But then when they make it so, I mean, it's like me and Marla were talking about it. By the time the end of, you know, we went for the, the our fifth lap when we hit, you know, 25 miles at like, I think we started at 10 o'clock at night. The whole course was mud. Yeah. Because you would get wet on one of the obstacles and then people would leave. And it was, you never stop seeing slick and mud and everything else. So, I mean, it didn't matter what obstacle you were on. There was mud on it. The biggest issue I had. There was I mud had... on horn. Yeah. The biggest issue I had with their course design was that um, they backloaded everything. Like the first half of the course, with the exception of well clung, and I'm, obviously you have a little bit of mud water um, in, you know, whatever they wanted to call their barbed wire crawl kit, or, or ideally kiss of mud, but it was snogging dirt or something. So you get a little wet there and that's fine. You expect to get wet there. Well, Kung, you were wet, whatever, but you didn't see any other mud until the halfway point. And then from there, that's when you first saw, you saw your first hanging obstacle. It went hanging obstacle, water obstacle, hanging obstacle, water obstacle or mud obstacle and you know some of the hanging obstacles had a water component but because you're soaking wet your hands are so muddy you're falling into the water and then you're just getting more soaking wet more muddy um so there was no reprieve from being soaking wet and muddy and you're only putting the hanging obstacles when you're deliberately soaking wet and muddy and it got to the point where every single hanging obstacle, the volunteers said, don't even waste your energy. Jump in the water right here. 
all you have to do is put your foot in the water. Just just touch the water and go do the penalty. Nobody's making it. Just go do the penalty. And I'm sorry for an obstacle mm-hmm. course race. You should never have volunteers saying, don't even attempt the obstacle. It's not it's not beatable. Don't do it. I mean, there were some obstacles where the volunteers weren't even calling people back to physically touch the obstacle or touch the water. It was, oh, no, you can go do that. Yeah. Like what? Yeah. This was a glorified more... trail race. Yeah. I mean, and I will say this, that that's the first time I've seen Augustus loop the way it was. Normally it's the pipe and what the, the, the cargo net made it a little bit different and, and harder, but there was a couple other ones. Like the first time we went through um, our first, first lap, they were finally there on the second lap. They had the water station with no volunteers. Right. That I like, think it was actually the first two laps. They didn't have, it wasn't until our third lap that they finally had volunteers. And that was only because we had Dan McDonald from Spartan, Spartan with us who went up to him and said, why are there no volunteers at the water station? Yeah. I because mean, when I, we got there, there was, we were pouring our own water out of the tanks because it, the, the, everything was empty. Yeah. Like, thankfully, yeah. they had that bathroom open because I know almost yep. everybody had to stop on that first lap because you're so well hydrated. Um, the fact that they didn't have any of those other bathrooms open what was just appalling. I can't imagine what the volunteers had to go through, like knowing they've been there all day and you're not even allowing them to use the bathrooms. Um, but no reason why and they shouldn't. Yeah, no reason why they shouldn't have had volunteers at that water station. I mean, good on Tough Mudder for somehow having every single obstacle with volunteers, multiple volunteers, Mm -hmm. literally the entire race. I mean, you you talk about like well-clung or um, dingleberries that didn't open until like nine o'clock at night. And you had at least two people sitting there all day Mm -hmm. so like good on them definitely probably could have moved one of them off of like a well clung or dingleberries that didn't open until later and put them at the water station at that point um but like you gotta do the bare minimum have somebody at a water station because not only Mm -hmm. Are, should they be responsible for pouring that water? But like, that's also a key point where, you know, if somebody is hurting, if they need medical attention, you know, God forbid like somebody like sits down to use the bathroom and like they can't get back up. Like, <laughs> you know, you, you don't think it's going to happen, but you're also running for 25 hours and like those cramps can kick in anywhere. And that is the only point on that course where you have a restroom. So things yeah. could go south really quickly and you need to have volunteers there. Yeah. I mean, the, the, it had its issues, but I mean, it was one of those things. It was a great, to me, it was a great feeling. It was good to be there. It was to finally experience it because I was supposed to years ago, but to finally experience and be there. And I mean, the pit cruise to me, that was amazing. Mm-hmm. How many people had just such amazing pit crews? Like we had, you know, um, two people from the more heart than scars that were pretty much pitting for all of us, Yeah, you know, and just seeing all the, the, the pit crews as you come in and, you know, they had food for us, they had everything, you know, ready to go for us, which was, was amazing. And to see that for everybody. Yeah. I will say it. My pit crew I saw was your pit crew out there. A couple probably times. one of the best pit crews, and I might be biased, but I mean, I had Ian Hosick, and then I had someone. His name's Zach Miller, and he's an experienced ultra runner, and they knew exactly what to do when it needed to happen. And I, I mean, there were only a couple very little issues that I had, um, and you know, they were on top of it as much as physically possible and like when time came to like get me out of my wetsuit that was probably my fastest pit because I I ran in Ian had already grabbed my brown bib and you know Zach immediately started taking my bib off getting me out of my jacket 
and he they had a towel laid down for me they pulled off my shoes pulled off the socks they said okay one two three and they both just yanked at the exact same time and off came my wetsuit and then they you know had my new shoes my new socks ready to go they put it on they said get the hell out of here I said I have to go to the bathroom they said no you don't have time just go okay as I'm like running out of the pit eating a slice of pizza so it was phenomenal which is amazing yeah and I mean that's awesome and that's one of the things that I you need to go to pit crew yes you completely do and Thankfully, like I made sure that they were on top of literally everything and they wrote down every single thing they did in between. So in the event I don't have them next year, I have somebody else. I can hand all of that over to the next person and say, this is what happened last year. Here is here's a general idea and we can go from there. We mm-hmm. just build off of every single race we do. Because at the end of the day, what works for you is going to keep being relatively consistent. And if you're used to one it one way, it needs to stay that one way. So, um, it yeah, I'm going to make sure yeah. next year I have some really great pit crew as well. And hopefully stay moving forward. Yeah. Hey, it's like we always say, nothing new on race day. So, and yep. that's one of the things, I mean, being your first first one and i mean that was kind of for me too i had never experienced world's toughest i just you know heard about it like i said i had a a friend i was supposed to do it with in 2020 you know we all know what happened in 2020 and we ended yep. up not doing it. that's actually why you saw the the picture that i had that yep. was that was her she she passed away that was charity that everyone talked about she passed away she was actually one of the hosts of BeastNet, and she okay. passed away in early this year so so that i took a picture with her so she was with me on the whole race but i mean it was it was so amazing. It was amazing just to see everyone and the way everyone came together. It was that feeling for that event. You know, if you, you take out all the, 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 anything negative, but just look at the people that were there doing it, the participants, that's the feeling that got me in the OCR. Oh, that 100%. feeling of hundred percent. Everybody was helping everybody. Everyone was, you know, I mean, <laughs> on uh, Everest, did those guys ever leave? No. I uh, so And that's what's amazing. Mutterhorn there, and Everest, there was a, a group that was just there. Yes. The entire time. And like shout out to those guys because they are phenomenal. I came through Everest once. I forget which lap it was, but it was in the middle of the night. And you could tell that they were hurting up there. They were trying to take a break. Mm-hmm. Uh so the people that were running up in front of me, they stuck around to grab the next person and swap out like normal. And like I was cramping and my body's hurting and I look at them and I'm like, oh, I'm not going to make it up. But I went running and I biffed it. I have a huge bruise on my ass now because, you know, I went I fell on my side, went sliding down and the um, the Everest Angels, they saw it. And you could tell, like, just the look on their face. They were, like, so hurting. They just wanted a break. And they said, we can get lower. Come on, we got you. And I went running up, and they got me. And every time they grabbed my arms, my elbows weren't even anywhere close to the wall. Because typically, you'll pull up and try to shimmy your elbows up and get over. And people are like, Megan, shimmy, shimmy. I'm like, my elbows aren't touching. So they literally just pulled me straight up. And I felt so terrible. So the next two times through, I said, you know, I'm not going to make them pull me up. I'm just going to take the penalty. And it wasn't until my last lap then that I... I went up Everest one more time because I said, you know, I am not finishing this race on a penalty. I am getting my ass up there. Um, Luckily, my friend Bam was also there. They had three guys that all grabbed me, pulled me over. Um, I was able to run and make it up straight to their hands, like no problems. And I was so thankful for them. But between the Everest Angels uh, the men and women of Mutterhorn who were phenomenal and shout out to, you know, David, he is such a great guy. Um, I consider him a friend. He's from Wisconsin and I'm from Wisconsin. Every time he sees me, he brings me chocolate from back home. He's like, 
Megan, I do a fundraiser for the chocolate shop in your hometown. So I'm every single time he brings me chocolate bars. And he what every time he saw me come up, he told everybody to move out of the way, like let me come through. I'm like, no, you don't have to do that. Like I'm good. I'm like I can wait. He's like, no, 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 you're you're moving quick. You're gonna go. Um, so thank you to the, every single one of them because they are so phenomenal. And then also, I mean, the guys out at, and and women, there were some women out there at Dublin Walls as well. And I don't know if any of them stayed the entire day, but there were always people consistently there hanging out and lifting people up. They weren't in any hurry to get moving on no. and we could not have done it without them. No. And that's what amazes me is, I mean, just to get those people that, you know, I mean, they signed up like everybody else, but they basically mm -hmm. did a lap, stopped there and never moved. I mean, every yeah. time we came up to Everest, it was the same, the same group of people up there. And I know how tough that can be. I mean, that's yeah. one thing, you know, most listeners know two years ago, it was Everest that broke my rib, you know, and mm -hmm. it was doing that. I turned around to help some people. And as I was reaching down, one of the people was a little heavy and pulled me down into the wall Ooh. as I was lifting him up and it broke my rib. So, I mean, it's and they're up there for 24 hours. Pulling could people up and over that wall. Could you imagine paying hundreds of dollars for a race, flying out there, getting lodging, and you give your entire race to helping other people? Like they are truly the most incredible people in this sport. Yeah. And Everest Angels, I think, is the best name for them. Yeah. I mean, they just sat up there the whole time and helped people over the walls, which is yeah. amazing. Which is amazing. I mean, and that's the one thing like I was, you know, telling someone else, I'm like, that's what reminded me of why I started doing this. Yeah. You know, the last couple of years has been tough for me because I just haven't had that feeling anymore of really enjoying it mm -hmm. and that, that family, family feeling and everything else. I mean, ever since COVID kind of shut everything down and some of my family didn't really, you know, my racing family didn't come back to racing. Yep. It's been tough for me. And I think these last couple of races and really, if you've never done a world's tough, toughest model, anyone that's listening to this, it's worth it. 100%. Just even, even to pit, go out there and be someone's pit crew and just see Show what's up happening. for the orphan tent. Just go oh, yeah. and help the orphans something. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, I, there were so many people that showed up and they took off, you know, at noon maybe did one two three laps and then night was coming and they went and they pitted for people until the mm -hmm. morning they went out one more time to get that 24-hour finisher and they called it a day they weren't out there looking to do any high mileage they weren't chasing you know mileage bibs they just wanted to be there help other people and experience world's toughest mutter for themselves mm -hmm. my roommate yeah told her boyfriend who is my best friend um he's the person who comes out and races with me the most he wasn't able to do world's toughest mutter this year and he together they said okay she is going to come out and run world's toughest mutter in a couple of years she doesn't race she's done fenway city field a couple times she's not necessarily like the biggest fan of races and she said yeah I'm going to do it in a couple years and Brian says it's going to be a couple year training thing for me and I said honestly you can show up with you know you don't need to go in with the expectation of I'm going to be out there for 24 hours you can show up yeah. you can do your sprint lap you can do the first couple of hours where you know it's mostly just the get in your way type of obstacles are open and then go out one final time when you know the sun is coming up and you get your 24 hour band headband and then you can pit for him the entire time you can go sleep just you know go have fun enjoy the atmosphere and you know, that can suffice for world's toughest mutter. You don't have to go out there with determined to wreck your body. No, you know, because that was one thing. And, and that was one of the mistakes that I made. I didn't plan for 
we're going back to the tent and sleeping. So I didn't have a sleeping bag. I didn't have anything. Cause I'm like, eh, it's 24 hours. Why would I need that? And then we did the five laps and came back in after 25. And because at 25, Marla got a, an adaptive ba- a bit. Yeah. The 25 mile ad- adaptive bit. So we came back in basically to pit and took like four hours where we just kind of slept. I didn't, I just got up and walked around, talked to people, helped people, you know, did whatever for four hours. And then, you know, but everybody else went and lay down and well, most of them, a few of us didn't do it, but so there's always that option. Like yeah. you said, the, to get the 24 hour big, you just have to start a lap after 7 a.m. And that's it. Yeah. You yeah. Do one lap before you could do 10 miles and you get the 24 hour bit. I, so, I met I mean, somebody on the first how do you lap. Move it? She went out on the first lap, said, you know, I've been dealing with injuries. I'm going to come out after seven. And I saw her again on her second lap, which was also her last lap. And, you know, she didn't quite remember me because I looked different. I was in my wetsuit or whatever else. And I said, oh, how did you enjoy pitting all night? And she's like, oh, my gosh, that, that was you that I was talking to. You're still going. This That's incredible. And like, you know. Everybody goes out there with a different set of mm-hmm. intentions and whatever you're looking to do is okay. Yeah. Just go out and do what you can do. I mean, for me, it was one of those things when I went out, my entire purpose that the whole time was to assist Marla. Yeah. So if she was out on the course, I was out on course with her. And that was my whole purpose for you. It was go for it. And I yeah. mean, you did, you did amazing. Thank you. I mean, you. how many miles did you get? So I, what was it? I only got 55, which I I can kind of speak to this because um, I've, I've had so many clients that have come out to World's Toughest Mudder for years. And I have some clients that maybe didn't do everything I set up, out for them for training. So, you know, whether that like they couldn't fit all of their long runs in or they couldn't do all their strength work. Like there were things that were programmed that they weren't able to do. And Mm -hmm. I'll admit going into those, I've, I had felt, oh my gosh, I'm nervous for so-and-so. I know that their goal is 50 miles and I don't feel like they put in the work to hit 50 miles. And some of them did. And it was, it's amazing. Like, I'm so proud of them for getting 50 miles. But me thinking like, I worked so hard for this race. I put in so many miles, so many training hours. Um, I changed up my diet. I stopped drinking. I focused on my sleep. I don't have a personal life anymore. I'm like, I am trained to get more than 50 miles. In my head, I'm like, I have, I know people that have gotten 50 miles that didn't put in as much work. And if I, I know 50 miles is going to come easy for me. I want to hit 75 because that is a big jump. And I don't want to just have a brown bib to show for it. And, you know, I will be the first to admit, I had not felt 50 miles at World's Toughest Mudder before. I had not felt 24 hours nonstop without sitting down, taking a little break. I never felt any of that before World's Toughest Mudder. So I will completely own up to my ignorance. As I came in for 45 miles, I'm crying. My body's cramping and hurting. And I'm saying, I don't want to do any more penalties. I can't do any more penalties. This is demoralizing. This course is demotivating for me. I have no motivation to run because I know I'm going to end up having to do all these penalty loops. So what's the point anyways? You know, I'm falling into that dark spot and I'm like, guys, you wasted your time coming out here if I'm only going to get 50 miles. And I I said, I, I just have one question. I said, why am I not seeing 50 mile bibs out there? And they said, Megan, not many people are earning them. I said, what do you mean not many people are earning them? I said, 50 miles is usually nothing. It's five mile course. You know, these this course wasn't hard. He said, the penalty loops are getting everybody. Everybody is feeling the exact same way you are. Everybody is lacking the motivation. They're so sick of these penalties. 
people are taking breaks, they're hurting. You're one of the only people that is con consistently going out without taking breaks. They said, there's only a few 50 mile bibs out there. They said, you're, you're about to go out, you're going to go get that 50. And that's what I did. I came in after 50 and the, the finish line was open and the announcers were calling out people as they were coming in, celebrating, taking their finisher photos. And I remember as I'm running through and they're like, Megan Beck, 50 miles. I just put my finger up and I start circling saying, I'm going again, I'm going again. And that's when I see Ian holding my bib saying, I got it, I got it. And um, then they take off my wetsuit and I'm like, put that 50 mile bib on me they said we didn't even get write your number on it we didn't know you were going out in it I said if I got that 50 mile bib I'm getting it dirty said I am wearing it proudly because not many people are wearing those 50 mile bibs and there were only a few people that I passed out there getting that 50 mile bib dirty but we were all you know congratulating each other high-fiving each other anybody that I saw with that brown bib regardless of if it got dirty or not I said that is one hell of a fight you put out there because that was not an easy course to get 50 miles. No. No, and I mean, that's what's amazing. I mean, you earned that. And that was one of the things, because I mean, if you look at, you know, for reference, I mean, people look at last year, you know, the, the, yeah. the distances that people were getting compared yeah. to this year. I mean, the numbers were a lot lower on the yeah. mileage. They said at the brunch that they didn't want anybody to get 100 miles. Yeah. Like I have friends that got 75 miles last year that barely got 50. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously Chris is a big one that we can point out. Chris has been running a hell of a lot more miles this year than she did last year. She's in, I, I would probably say she's in a better shape, but I mean, I don't know her personally or the training she's putting in, but for her to get 90 miles after getting 100 miles last year, she looked really good out there. But even still, like, she would go in, jump straight into the water and take that penalty because she knew that it's it was just a waste of energy yeah. to attempt to fight for some of these obstacles when you're going to end up falling in anyways. Yeah. So, Might you as well know. Jump and do it. Yeah. I wanted 75. I'm sure if my ultra track would have been on, I probably came close to 75 miles. Um, probably. Again, I don't know. My Garmin says 66.9. Um, I just know that my ultra track was way off. So I'm just going to continue to say 70 miles was where I got. And I could have kept going. Had there not been all of those horrible penalties, I would have been able to go out on one last one because I finished 2352. And if I knew that I could hit every single obstacle without a penalty, I would have done one more and gotten, you know, at least to 60. But, you know, I probably at that point could have beat the hanging obstacles, but I knew I couldn't do well clung. Um, Twinkle Toes, no. I had only beaten once through the night. Grappler, I hit it. Or I attempted it three times, and after that, I just started giving up my band every single time there. I didn't want to do Operation. Like, I didn't need to go out and do one, one more lap. So. No, you did amazing. I mean, you you did good. That's one thing, because I've done the 24-hour, the like, the cease to, but it's just running loops. Yeah. There's no obstacles. There's mental obstacles and a few weird things that you have to do, but there's nothing like that. Nothing like, you know the the obstacles like you know at a tough mutter the world's toughest so it was definitely a new experience and definitely one I want to do again yeah I I'm so excited so, to hear you want to do it again so what are you thinking for next year I don't know because it, it's kind of one of those I think if the team needs me I might do the the help again but I kind of I want to see what I could do myself as well I, I, I want to see should. what I could do just go out there and just go for the laps and do what I can, especially if I can get back into which, okay, it's not can when I get back into the training, like I did in 2020 and 2021 and drop down to where I should be, you know, physically. Um, I think I could, uh, you know, uh, 50 would be my goal. I mean, 
But I mean, who knows? Because it's going to be in Central Florida. And from everything I've heard in Central Florida, it's just mud. Mm-hmm. So yep. at least the Spartan is. If it's anywhere near where the Spartan is, it's going to be just mud. Yeah. So we just got to hope we don't see any gators. Yeah, Which might make your run faster. I think I read somewhere that the reason why we didn't have to do the um, Statue of Liberty was because they found a gator in that lake. Oh. Yeah, I Googled it and apparently there there's not many, but there are some gators in Dallas. Yeah. So that's... I don't I don't know if that's the truth or not, but like that's a very good reason not to make us do Statue of Liberty. Yes, that is hey, like I said, make you definitely go faster. But... It makes me wonder, and I haven't run the Central Florida venue at all, but it makes me wonder if all of the um all of the water obstacles next year if they're going to have to be man-made and like have animal control you know come out the morning of chase everything out and then have people sitting at those obstacles like literally all day and if there's you froze i i you froze can you hear me you anything You're frozen. There you okay, go. Now I you're see back. you moving now. Okay, awesome. But yeah, I'm. It, it I couldn't tell who froze if it was me or you, but yeah, I don't know. But um, it makes me wonder if they're gonna have to have the man-made pits, animal control come out, ch- chase anything out of there, and then put volunteers at every single water pit. And if they see a gator coming anywhere close calling animal control like you cannot let anybody leave those water pits the entire time the race is going because you turn your back and a gator is going to come yeah that's good that that would definitely make for an interesting obstacle yeah um, i mean gators are one of my biggest fears like i don't need gators they, See, they're for me, it's... one of two animals that enjoy killing for fun i read that somewhere one of two yeah. animals that enjoy killing for fun and the other is humans so wow yeah, yeah. I see that the only one that ever bothers me is jellyfish oh jellyfish creep me out i mean snakes also creep me out but yeah, i'm getting used to those I keep seeing them around here they've been uh... at, like my doorstep multiple times now no thank you But we do have rattlesnakes on the trails here in um, Boston. So I haven't seen one yet, but there's rumors. Mm. It's not good. We we definitely should have a follow up to this and talk about like getting serious for World's Toughest Mudder because I'm really Mm -hmm. hoping we just convinced a lot of people to go out and run it. I hope so. Because it's amazing. So yeah, I'll say as much as I disagree with their the course design and the penalties um the atmosphere and the race itself is well worth it um it at is. the end of the day like yeah i'm going to remember that the penalties sucked but i'm going to remember the feeling of crossing the finish line the feeling of you know everybody cheering me on you know mm-hmm. you running with somebody you don't know and you say hey good job what lap are you on you know, mm-hmm. you're. I'm gonna remember Coach's Corner, not slogging through the mud, but like dancing my way up to it. And I'm gonna remember Sandy giving me a hug every time I got to Augustus Gloop. Like, there's so many great memories from this that at the end of the day, like, I'll remember. Oh, the penalty loops were long, but I'm not gonna remember the pain I was in or how many. Yeah how it felt to go through all of those lengthy penalties. I'm just going to remember that I kept crossing that finish line. I kept crossing that start line and I just had a smile on my face to most of the night. Yeah. Every time I saw you, you had a smile. So, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Um, yeah. We're definitely going to have to do another one. Maybe yes. sooner than normal so we can really kind of talk about, cause I'd like to really get into the prep like you said for for next year because there's a lot of things that i i had with me that i didn't need that was overkill mm-hmm. but a lot of things i didn't have so, yeah um, yeah no 
even yeah. I learned some really big things with this race, um, with the prep, with my nutrition, with, you know, so many different aspects. And it now that I felt the 24 hours nonstop, I, and I know what cramped and I can figure out why things cramped or why I felt certain ways. It's going to help me further tailor my training, not only for me, but for my clients. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, everything is still a learning experience. And now we take what we learned and we can apply it. So I would love to like dive deeper into what we actually learned from it. Yeah, I would definitely like to. If you want to do one earlier, then let's do it because I would definitely love to dive deeper into it too. Because it's like my my thoughts always been: if you're not learning, you're not living. So exactly, one hundred percent. No, perfect. Well, thank you. And yes, thank we're, you. We're hitting that mark where Don's gonna start yelling at us again. Yep. But let's uh, plan a, an earlier one soon. Okay, and go perfect. And talk about planning for next year. So definitely. All right. Okay. All right. I'll talk to you soon. Yep. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to the BeastNet podcast. If you haven't done it yet, find us on Facebook. Like and share the podcast. Give us a review on iTunes or Spotify. All these things will help to expand the show in the future. Don't forget to subscribe and let us know what you think and what you'd like to hear. Yeah.